actually. It's December 2019. This is the monthly market update where I have compiled news articles and commentary across the past month. This is a story about a dude named Lane. Then one day he went and tried to rent them out. And then he became one real investor man. If you guys haven't subscribe to the podcast simple passive cashflow.com check it out and also check out the youtube channel i've been getting a lot better adding more videos there too if you guys want a free version of my ebook um text ebook to 587-317-6099 and um, join our facebook community if you have not already so our first article here is Apple committing $2.5 billion toward California housing crisis. So they're saying that they will commit $2.5 billion towards efforts of solving the obvious affordable housing issue in Northern California. I used to work for a city and these are always, there's always a negotiation to give permits. That's the leverage a municipality has over you know, big companies like this and you know these big companies they would like to build infrastructure like sidewalks curbs and not have to do ridiculous detention tanks under new construction and different stormwater anyway um, the municipality has leverage over them so this is a way that the, that the municipality can kind of negotiate things for the community I mean, it seems like it's a Oh, it's a wonderful thing that Apple has done, but no, they probably, it's, it was, it's just a deal, deal between them and the municipality, just like how Google did this and Microsoft, I had firsthand um, view on what Microsoft did in their city. And this just kind of shows failures for markets and public policy to meet the housing needs. I wouldn't want to live in Northern California unless I had a huge tech salary. Yep. That's, uh, and I see in the chat window, cronyism. That's uh, exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> Next article here, 2019 rent growth chart here from mid-November. This one they release pretty often. Multifamily rent growth is back in, in the black, increasing $1 to an average of 1400 bucks about per month. The takeaway is that the rent growth are still happening. Class B and C investors are circling secondary and tertiary markets. And this is no secret to a lot of us simple passive cash flow investors targeting non-primary markets for the cash flow and not having to compete with dumb money, to say the least. So there, and I'm quote here, it's fueled by strong employment and a growing group of renters by choice investor exuberance for multifamily properties is spilling over into older properties as well as secondary and tertiary markets buyer older properties and renovating them meanwhile can offer better returns i think we all know this but you know not everybody in the world thinks like this there on the bottom we ha i had a chart that i took from the last uh, apartment you know, those are the typical class B and C rents that you're going to see in a lot of these secondary and tertiary markets, you know, anywhere from 550 a month up to $800 a month. Definitely a culture shock to a lot of us that live in primary markets where you're used to seeing houses cost $300,000, $400,000 or more and paying $2,000 a month rent for a little studio. For those of you who um, want to kind of come back to this presentation, you guys um, can read this later. But this is the third quarter 2019 United States multifamily capital markets. They do a good job of just running down the high level of what's kind of happening across the nation. And it's interesting to track this each quarter to each quarter. No surprise, yields are compressed nine basis points, which isn't very much year over year. And that's consistent with what I'm feeling. But it's nothing like I think a lot of people are like, oh, no, the, the sky is falling and we'll never be able to get yield. Um, there's yield there. The gap is closing very slow, slowly, but it's still there. But you're not buying the average. You know, They come up with this number where they average probably a million deals out there. Um, you're trying to find that one 
needle in the haystack. And, you know, if you're patient, you'll find it. Rent growth, you know, just like the last publication I just mentioned, they're saying that the rent growth increased 3.2% nationally, which is up 60 basis points over last year. Article about those um, impacting those doing Airbnb and short-term rentals, uh, Jersey City joins the push to block Airbnb, uh, where what they're doing is they're going to bar renters from listing their apartments on the site, as well as owners who don't live on site. And this is another reason why I don't like short-term rentals at all. I prefer blue-collar, workforce housing, long-term rentals, just boring stuff. Article title is multifamily rents rise as a vacancy tightens. Effective rents for institutional properties. And what they mean by institutional properties are like, you know, these are the big ones, typically the A-class, because it's easier for them to get data on this. They're saying rents grew 3.3%, which is, you know, mimics kind of what we, very close to what the last news source mentioned. Um, up 1.6% over the previous quarter. So that's almost half of the annual growth in the last quarter, which makes sense because rent growth is pretty cyclical. When you get into these cold or slow months, you don't have as much demand. Not people are moving. So that makes total sense from a logical standpoint. Vacancy rates declined by 20 basis points to 5.8%, even as the apartment stock continues to expand. So they're building new units by 2% a year. More than 4,400 buildings providing almost 800,000 units are currently under construction. But remember, this is big data comprised of the whole United States, which is insightful yet not really useful because when you're an investor, you're trying to key in not only on a certain market, but a sub-market. You know, is it going to be Wes Irving as opposed to just the Irving, Texas, for example, or the DFW market. I took a couple pictures here of, you know, everybody loves these, like the top 10 happiest city, which they said it was Miami, Florida, Oakland, Austin, San, Ant San Jose, Philadelphia, LA, Boston, Honolulu, Portland, San Diego, and the America's top 10 dynamic cities, which is San Francisco, Seattle, Denver, Aurora, Grand Prairie, Oakland, Fort Worth, San Jose, Atlanta, Georgia, Miami, Florida. Where they get this data, I don't have a clue. And I don't think it, I, to me, I don't really read much into it, but people like these type of news articles. And um, so that's why I put it in here. Update on the whole China trade deal as of November 11th, 2019. Now the home loan started higher, but we were kind of safe middle of the month when the reports came out suggesting that a delay of a phase one trade deal was about to be signed. So it was a disruption or delay to the trade siding was the reason for the rates to improve off the worst levels midweek. There was word that both the United States and China would roll back tariffs as a deal would push through. And this pushed stocks to all-time highs as the expense of the bonds and the home loan rates. Uh, loan on the same level, they were back on July 31st when the Fed cut their rates for the first time in 10 years. Co-working spaces a little bit. If you haven't been watching the news and heard about headlines about the company WeWork, but... Essentially, if you read between the lines, and here's my summary of the whole thing, WeWork, along with many other tech companies, they're venture capital, and they have a lot of money backing them, which can power a lot of marketing and make a company look good. But like in any business, if you don't have organic marketing to create new customers for you, your business will likely fail. It just matters depends on how much artificial capital you can burn up to keep this thing going. And just like any business, you have to kind of feed the beast until you kind of take off and go on your own. But we work, they kind of got to a point where they realized that they weren't making money doing this. And then they had a, um, another infusion of cash. 
the here is sort of the percentage of co-working spaces on a graph. I'm still less than 4%, even in Man Manhattan, and where the, mark the vacancy rates are for those real estate usage. The trend line is showing the higher amount of vacancy, the lower amount of percent co-working. So New York, Manhattan, Brooklyn, they have a low vacancy rate, which means a high demand, and that's why they have more percent of co-working space. Um, but most of these, these cities follow the trend line. Um, not really too many outliers here. More than half of the world's richest investors see a big market dip drop in 2020, says a UBS survey. And this is from the good old CNBC news station, whether that's good or bad or not. So they're saying they surveyed 3,400 high net worth investors, how they got those people and what the heck kind of high net worth investors are going to sit on the phone for four minutes and answer a survey is my other question. But they said 55% of respondents expected a significant drop in the market in some point in 2020. And they also said that the super rich have increased their cash holdings to 25% of their average assets. Put this in here mainly to kind of show people a little measuring stick. Like you have high net worth invest or people here, and maybe, and they're still not sitting on any more than a quarter of their net worth in cash. And, and here's my message: if you're not rich, if your net worth is under one million dollars, one million dollars is really not that money. And oftentimes I see those under $1 million net worth sitting on a large, huge majority, like almost 75% of the money in cash or stuck in lazy debt equity in their home or other rental properties paid off. I mean, it, you would think it'd be the opposite, right? High net worth investors should have more cash on hand because they have, you know, they don't need to get yield. They don't need cash flow to eat, eat from. That was my, my takeaway, the 25% level for cash flow sitting on the sidelines from some random survey of, of high net worth people. Me, I, I'm kind of more like, I don't know, like 10% or something like that. I invest aggressively. Maybe part of that is because I feel like I have good deal flow, but I invest in majority cash flowing investments that are cash flowing today. So this next chart here is taken from Arbor, who is a direct Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac lender. Orange graph is showing the corporate debt, which is going up, and the household debt, which peaked in 2008, 2009, obviously, is on the decline, which is, in my opinion, a good thing. This is similar to the levels of 2000 where corporate debt was at 46 percent ish and household debt was at a little over 70 percent hillwood to develop a 1 million square foot amazon fulfillment center in north mississippi put this in here as just a you know, a lot of people, they look at all these headlines of this building going into Seattle or this building going in San Francisco. I frankly, don't really care about any of this stuff. I look at more of these type of articles. Here's an A-class industrial campus going in next to US Highway 78. More importantly, next to BNSF and Norfolk Southern Railroad Lines. This is a similar play to people going into Memphis for the old FedEx and UPS transit hubs. You know, these days you're looking for yield. You can't really go to secondary markets, your Kansas cities, your Memphises, because they've been picked over since 2012, 2016. You've really got to kind of go into these more tertiary markets that nobody ever really is talking about. I'm not saying that this is a good market to invest in, but maybe you should look into some of these, a market like in Northern Mississippi. Uh, again, it is in DeSoto County. 
CBRE industry preps for the new EB-5 regulations. So those of you that aren't aware of EB-5 is the old way to, if you're international, you want to become a U.S. citizen, well, you can pay to play because we'll take your money and we'll give you citizenship so we can get money. You have to invest in an asset that my understanding is that it helps the United States economic or it just benefits America. I see it as sort of like a donation in a way to get citizenship, but they used to be, they're gonna increase the target that you, you're supposed to put up from $500,000 to $900,000, and it's supposed to pace inflation. And the standard minimum investment will rise by the same percentage, um, going from $1 million to $1.8 million. So I've heard of a lot of people coming into the country this way, Again, a lot of the international money, people coming in, they're not the 1% of their country. They're like the 0.01%. So just plunking down a million dollars on something like that is, think about it if you're going to the airport and you want the fast pass, but the fast pass is way better, but it was 10 times price and money was no object to you, you do it. These charts are talking about millennial renters they ask these millennials why do you expect to always rent and some of the excuses i mean some of the ex the reasons were i can't afford to buy a house with 69 percent the next one is i like the flexibility that renting provides third with 37 percent is i prefer to avoid maintenance and added costs and then last one was buying a home is financially risky. And then they ask millennials who plan to buy a house, why are you waiting? What's your excuse? And 70% said, I can't afford to buy right now. 33% said, I'm not ready to settle down yet. 24% said, I'm waiting to get married, probably to share the costs. And then there's another chart that they put in here and they split up the different demographics. I'm not gonna go into that. You guys can check that out later um, by, by going to simplepassivecashflow.com slash investor letter and you guys can download these slides there. Those are the news articles that I dug up this month. Here are the new Simple Passive Cashflow articles and podcasts that I created this month. The first one was a lot of my investors, they, they might be totally on board with financial freedom and investing in alternative assets, but they may have a reluctant spouse. And in, in fact, this is in most cases, I call this reluctant spouse syndrome. So I pinged and surveyed a few people in my tribe and put down some useful tips on how to get your spouse on board, possibly create some kind of uh, midway there. So you guys can check out that article at simplepassivecashflow.com slash spouse. I'm starting to build a legal guide, just like the tax guide. And the tax guide you can find at simplepassivecashflow.com slash tax. But this legal guide that I've been um, creating is simplepassivecashflow.com slash legal. I'm not a tax attorney. I'm not a CPA. I'm not a lawyer. But here are some notes that I've been keeping for myself that you guys can also review. I have my last rental property on the market and I am showcasing what's happening with that one at simplepassivecashflow.com slash AL4. It's AL4 because it's in Alabama and it was my fourth rental in Alabama. I interviewed uh, Elisa Zahn. You guys can check out that interview there. Also, I interviewed a doctor who is doing short-term rentals. And if you're a doctor, I would go to that simple passivecashflow.com slash doctor. And there's a lot of other tidbits and thoughts for doctors on, you know, if you're a new doctor, what are some tips to, for financial freedom there and, and other mindsets. Even if you're a, probably a higher paid professional, I would recommend checking that out. Uh, for those of you who are still buying turnkeys, we did a webinar last week uh, where we talked about the mortgage lending requirements in 2020 and moving forward with Graham can check that out at simplepassivecashflow.com slash turnkey. The e-course went live on Black Friday for those of you who took advantage of the, that special launch pricing. It's at simplepassivecashflow.com slash e-course. 
And if you guys buy that, we can credit back to you the price you paid. If you choose to go into the mastermind at any point, uh, we currently have about 55 members in there. We do bi-weekly Zoom calls. We do networking similar to how we kick this meeting off here. It's a great way to get around the credit investors. Quit going to the Locaria or the free Facebook groups or the forums. You're just going to find a bunch of broke people there. And I launched the new investor portal for those of you in deals with me to access a, you have to create a login, then you get access to all the monthly updates there, just in case you miss an email. Cause we all get a lot of emails these days. And if you guys want to sign up, go to the, the website and you create a, um, join the deal club. You guys get access to the first three modules of the e-course. Those of you who are not verified with me yet, haven't set up a call with me yet, after you do that, you can get access to the past deal webinars to review and further your learning there. I'm just going to go over some updates that I've been doing personally. Man, November was a quick month, so I had to put this down really quickly. I've had a little bit of downtime to plan for 2020. And I'm starting to make key hires to help the group in Simple Passive Cashflow, notably a membership director for the mastermind groups. So what we're doing now is we're going through all the members and kind of building a little matrix and who's doing what, who we can connect with who. And then uh, we are going to kind of force the matchmaking to happen. Contribution. I felt like the whole addressing this reluctant spouse syndrome was a big issue I needed to sort of help people with. The, the graphic I have on screen is what we're all trying to avoid. This guy was wearing like one of those Apple watches and it just happened to be the day that he got fired. <laughs> so about 10 o'clock, he got the news that he got laid off. So his beats per minute went up, spiked up to 120 from a resting heart rate of 85. It kind of went down Oh, he had a meeting with HR a little around two o'clock and it spiked to 110. And then he left work at 530, went right back up as probably he went home because he didn't want to tell his spouse that his supposedly job that was keeping their family alive was no more. And then he went to bed at 110 beats per minute. So you don't want that to happen. And that's why you invest in alternative assets and you do something that everybody else doesn't do. Um, not because it's going to create the future want, but it's going to avoid situations like this. And maybe that's the pain that avoiding this pain will speak to you more than the financial rewards. Some cool things that I get to talk about here in my significant slide. I counted up the real estate control, 200 16 million dollars i guess that's almost a quarter billion three thousand units or so 24 million diverted from wall street from other passive investors in this hui so we are currently up to 226 live investors today uh, thank you for especially you guys have been with me for quite a few deals this next side is uncertainty because you're always trying to find ways to make things a little bit a surprise in life. As I'm planning 2020 for myself, I made it a goal not to go to real estate events where I know everybody and it's like cheers and everybody knows my name and I don't have to get out of my comfort zone because everybody already knows me. I'm going go to start to go to more private entrepreneur type of events where nobody knows me and different coaching groups and just do something a little bit different. A way I'm gonna get certainty in my life, I'm, we're starting to look at like doing asset management, taking that over from a third party in some of our deals and doing this in house. I don't know why I, have, I didn't do this in the past. I mean, maybe because I didn't like doing it as a job, as a project manager, but I'm sick and tired of seeing these accountants or computer programmers or non-professionals be project managers when this is exactly what I did at my job for 10 years and maybe even though I didn't like it or I didn't think I was that good, I can do a lot better than all these amateurs. What I did for relationships and connections and love, I took my wife out and we used a hundred dollar gift card that somebody gave us. So we took some time for that. <laughs> so I'm always trying to identify what is the resistance in my business and my life and try and eliminate those. 
and we had a webinar in our mastermind going over international trusts. And if you think LLCs and two layers of LLCs are cool, this is going to blow your mind. It's all about you know, getting over charging order protection, this fraudulent conveyance. It's much better than a domestic trust. Again, I, I have a lot of those notes in simplepassivecashflow.com slash legal if you guys want to check it out. And then part of this is like, there's no worse feeling than being in a lawsuit. And even if it's a stupid one, that somebody else can control your assets and do like a charging order, which is basically freeze your stuff and stop your ability to find future deals or even getting a home loan for yourself or maybe even getting a credit card. Creating complex advanced legal entities is a way of um, getting some leverage in those situations. And for me, it's money well spent. Other other frivolous things. I think my coffee sucks. I'm gonna stop using that K cup after my lot of 144 remaining K cup pods are gone. Probably gonna get one of those fifty dollar espresso machines. And Thanksgiving is always tough for me because I don't like to hear about people's jobs because it's most times just people complaining all the time. My attitude is if you don't like your job, then do something about it. Thanksgiving is over, thankfully. And Christmas is here and I bought myself some AirPods. These are finally the good ones that actually stay in your ear and gunk doesn't get stuck inside of them. Some lessons learned, I'm reading, well, I just finished this last night, The Richest Man in Babylon. A lot of people have recommended this book to me in the past. For the first couple of chapters, there was a big takeaway. It was like this really rich guy, he's, he's teaching this, um, this younger guy who's not rich at all, like, Hey man, how do I get rich? And then the, the old guy tells him, put aside 10% of your money and go and buy assets or go into deals that make you money. One of the first deals he goes into, he goes to like the blacksmith who's going to buy like spices from wherever. And then the old man is like, all right, well, that's cool. Like, yeah, that can possibly make you money. But why the heck are you investing with the blacksmith that, that doesn't know anything about spices? And then, you know, that's a lesson learned. The guy didn't make any money. But eventually he moves and he goes into a better deal and now he starts to see the, this uh, proof and concept. And at that point, after I read like the first 10 minutes of this book, it's written in old English, sort of like the Bible, and it totally puts me to sleep, which is why I didn't get anything out of the book and I eventually gave up on it. But now I can say I read it now when people talk about it because I get the gist of it. Well, uh, thanks for joining and uh, we'll see you guys next month on another monthly update.